Hello, my name is Tamara Sorrell. I'm currently Professor for Ecology and Macroecology at the University of Potsdam near Berlin in Germany. Most of my work is dedicated towards biodiversity modeling using a whole suite of different models ranging from ecological niche models to simulation models to spatially explicit population dynamic models. Today I will talk about standards for reporting ecological niche models or species distribution models. You've already heard quite a bit about it by Town Peterson and Xiao Fang. They've already given you quite a good introduction on reproducibility. Here I want to add a few more thoughts why transparency and reproducibility are important for ecological niche models. First, you don't do research just for yourself, but to grow knowledge. So communicating your science is a very critical step for making this knowledge public. So you should communicate it in a way that both current and future generations can understand and repeat your study. I also want to emphasize that transparency may increase your chances of getting published and it may also increase your chances that your results will have a longer lasting impact or a more practical impact by being included, for example, in biodiversity assessments. So here I've put together um, a little literature research that I did on 1st August 2020, summarizing how many publications there have been on ecological niche models during the past 25 years, so from 1996 onwards to today. And I could roughly identify seven, uh, 27,500 publications, um, and the, the number of publications are constantly rising. So all of these studies, of course, uh, serve different purposes. You've already heard about all the different applications of ecological niche models, um, ranging from understanding species biology to um, finding potential new species records, spatial prioritization, restoration or translocation of species, then um, applications on global change or biological invasions, or also more basic research on niche evolution. And as you have already heard by Xiao Feng, um, many of these ecological niche models actually lack transparency and are not reproducible. So you can imagine as the number of publications grows, as the number of um, ecological niche models grow, there is an ever higher competition in the field. So I argue that um, transparency in your models and in your methods will actually increase your chances of getting published. So just a small idea of how the publishing process actually works. So getting through peer review means, of course, that you first choose your um, an appropriate journal and you submit your manuscript to it. Then your manuscript will be checked by the editorial team. Um, if, if successful in this first check, it will um, go into external peer review and afterwards the editorial team will evaluate the external reviews and will make a decision. So these are the main decisions that could be made. In the most exceptional case, your study will be accepted straight away, um, or you will have the um, option for revising, which is already a great opportunity, or often also it will be rejected. And then you can, of course, submit it to a different journal, or you can revise it um, and, and submit it to a different journal. So reviewers and editors essentially act as gatekeepers. The editors are the first gatekeepers and they will judge um, very quickly um, on different issues. Um, for example, on whether the manuscript looks professional or whether it looks clear. But they are not necessarily experts on all the different um, methodological 
aspects, um, but if they judged the manuscript of, as having potential, they would send it out to the reviewers. And the reviewers are the second kind of gatekeepers, and they will ask whether um, the methods are sound and whether they are reproducible. So increasing the transparency and the reproducibility of your methods um, will actually increase your chances of getting past these gatekeepers. Another reason for why transparency and reproducibility is important in your ecological niche models is that often we use these models for providing the basis for conservation and policy decisions. So when we look back at all these different um, ENM applications, then all of those that are listed in black are actually um, conservation applications. And in recent review, a representative um, review of 400 publications, ENM publications, Miguel Araujo and colleagues actually found that 56% of all the studies that use or mention ecological niche models are actually um, serving a conservation purpose, a conservation application. So you can imagine that um, for providing a basis for conservation, of course, these ecological niche modeling studies have to fulfill some minimum standards. For example, the IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, they defined a minimum set of standards for assessing species threat status under climate change. You can read this up in the Red List guidelines, um, for example, in the section 1219 on inferring reductions from bioclimatic models. And more generally, how biodiversity assessments look like, um, or any um, assessments really, um, this is a nice sketch by Miguel Araujo and colleagues. So first, um, assessors will define what is the actual assessment goals. Do we want to assess the state of biodiversity, for example? Then they will do a literature uh, research based on certain criteria. Um, and they will evaluate the quality of the literature and then analyze and summarize um, the, the literature that made it through the quality check. So Miguel Arrojo and colleagues actually suggested that we need more standards for models and biodiversity assessments to, to actually evaluate this quality of the, of the literature. And um, Town Peterson has already mentioned um, these standards. So uh, Miguel and colleagues, they suggested um, standards ranging from bronze, silver to golden standards, to aspirational standards, but also clearly um, mentioning some, some models as, as deficient, which should not enter any biodiversity assessment. So here I want to argue that um, the very first step for actually establishing standards for models is that we establish standards for reporting models. So we can't uh, really judge the quality of a model if we don't find all the information necessary to judging that quality. So best practice standards cannot be achieved without standard procedures for metadata and for reporting. And we have seen a few recent developments. Town Peterson has already named a few of them. And, and Chao Feng has already introduced his checklist uh, of the essential elements to reproduce ecological niche models. Then there is another um, um, development that hasn't been mentioned so far, I think by Corin Merrow, a metadata dictionary for reproducing ecological niche modeling results. And Town has already mention, mentioned also the standard protocol for describing ecological niche models and scientific publications that um, I published together with a lot of different colleagues this year. So you've already heard by Xiao um, about this checklist. They um, basically had uh, four different categories on the um, biodiversity data, the environmental data, the model and the um, extrapolation and assessment of models. And what they found is that a lot of current ecological niche models do not um, provide 
um, do not report this full checklist. So um, a lot of essential items for reproducibility are actually missing. Cory Mero introduced um, these range model metadata data standards, or Cory together with colleagues. They published that last year in Global Ecology and Biogeography. And uh, first of all, they came up with some kind of metadata dictionary, also to provide a common vocabulary how things should be called, because we have all these different subdisciplines. Um, vegetation ecologists um, call um, models differently from resource selection function models, although they essentially use very similar methods. To, so in order to find a common currency, we also need like a common language. And Corey Mero um, and colleagues provided a, a dictionary for that, but also a hierarchical structure and a, a metadata standard for how to, to output um, all the information that are necessary to repeat a model. And they also provided an R package for that range model metadata that we will come back to later. And this year um, we published um, the OTMAP protocol, a standard protocol for reporting species distribution models or ecological niche models. And that was really a community effort by a lot of different colleagues, including Town Peterson, including Xiao Fang and Corey Merrow and a lot of other people that um, you might have heard of before. The OTMAP protocol basically follows the main steps of ecological niche model building. Um, first, the conceptualization phase, which really provides the overview of what you're going to do um, in your modeling exercise. Then the second phase, data preparation, data processing. Third, the model fitting process. Fourth, the assessment of the model and evaluation. And fifth, the prediction in space and time. So you will actually see the, um, the initial letters of these five model building steps makes up the name OTMAP. And we see that the overview or conceptualization that really sets the scene of your modeling exercise. So um, also in the OTMAP protocol, this part will um, um, contain all the general specifications that you need to understand the modeling exercise, while the other four sections will actually contain more technical details that are necessary to reproduce the technical aspects of the work. So the overview, for example, contains the model objective, but we also contain information on the taxon, the location, the predictors, on the conceptual underpinning, the availability of software, codes and data, and the other uh, OTMAP sections, data, model fitting, assessment, prediction, will contain elements that are um, very similar to a lot of the checklist items that uh, Xiao already introduced. Potentially, they, are, uh, they contain a bit more aspects because now we've really got together a big community um, discussing or highly debating um, at times what should be in the protocol and what should not. I also want to say that um, OTMAP actually was inspired by a previous protocol, the ODD or OT protocol that was published by Volker Grimm and colleagues um, in 2006. And that is a protocol for describing individual based and agent based models. So basically for describing simulation models and, for, uh, and it provides a structure for how these simulation models, how certain design decisions in these models um, should be described in publications. Um, there was also a review and a first update of that protocol after a couple of years, after the first five years, and it already showed that it was quite successful in, um, in, in really structuring the information that is necessary for, for understanding these models. And as a reviewer and editor, I was um, quite often frustrated that the information on species distribution models was so desperate. Uh, 
um, was distributed all over the place, all over the manuscripts when I was reading them. So here you see um, what OTMAP is about, giving information about these five different sections, overview, data, model, assessment and prediction. And on the left you, uh, you see just one um, example that we reviewed where all these information were stored in the original publication. And you see that bits that are essential for the OTMAP checklist were contained in the introduction, in the methods, in the results, and discussions, and some elements were actually not reported at all. So to, to give that a, a certain structure, that's uh, where the idea of OTMAP was actually born, inspired by the ODD protocol. And it actually gives us the possibility or the opportunity to, to having this OTMAP structure, to have all the information that we need for reproducing and understanding the methods, have that all in one place, contained um, at a central place of the manuscript, in the, basically in the methods section and where we exactly know where to expect different information on the modeling process and know exactly where to find it. So the OTMAP checklist um, should um, provide benefits for, uh, for different users, for the authors. It um, provides a checklist for designing the study and um, provides a help for writing the publication for reviews. It facilitates the peer review um, process and uh, can provide um, essential author guidelines, actually how to describe methods. And for evaluators, it uh, provides an easy way of doing meta-analysis because it defines exactly where to find what kind of information. So here just a small information of where information can be found in, in publications. So we have this entire OTMAP um, protocol and we actually recommend to always provi provide the OTMAP table um, in bullet uh, point format in the supplementary material because that will really facilitate evaluation and, and meta-analysis because you have like all the information at one place. Um, at some point in the future, it would also be um, great to, to have an OTMAP repository where we can um, collect all of these OTMAP tables. Additionally, you, you have, of course, you have to provide flow text uh, of, your, uh, of your models in the methods section. And here, OTMAP can actually help you to structure the methods section. So in, in what kind of order should you report um, different items of the modeling process? But we also suggest that you can actually keep the methods quite short by using OTMAP if you just concentrate on the overview um, part of OTMAP as a, and provide this as flow text in your method section, while all the technical details um, will only be contained in the full OTMAP table that should be in your supplement anyway. So this could also be a nice way of actually making your, um, your method section much shorter. So this is how the OTMAP table can look like, or this is actually just a short version for, for the long version. Please um, look on uh, to my website or to the original publication where the full OTMAP table is contained as a um, CSV file in the supplementary material. So the OTMAP table will always look a little different. You see that here, um, that you have to define the model objective very early on. So is your model actually meant just to make inference, um, to, to understand the biology of your species, or is it meant to, to, to mapping, to interpolating spatial predictions, or to making transfers in, in space or in time? And depending on these model objectives, different elements of the OTMAP table are important to report. You see that here, um, um, color-coded, that we have identified a lot of elements that are always um, required to report, that are obligatory. And then we have elements that are here in greenish and purple that are only necessary if you either um, 
aim at mapping or interpolating uh, or if you aim at forecasts and transfers. And you will also see that some items remain um, blank or white um, because these are really context dependent and do not need reporting all the time. So if we zoom into this a little, you see um, in the overview section, um, again, this model objective that, um, that will determine how the OTMAP table look like. And the other important thing about the overview section is that it actually the OTMAP actually encourages you to reflect your modeling decisions. So this is an essential part of the overview uh, um, section that you reflect on your hypothesis, what are your hypotheses about the biodiversity environment relationships, what are essential assumptions that you, you make in the modeling process, for example, the equilibrium assumption, or that you assume that all of your records um, are, um, are bias-free, that you um, have good data. Then we also encourage you to justify your model complexity in the algorithms chosen um, and also encourage you to provide a brief description of your modeling steps. And all of these main justifications of your model decisions will be contained in the overview section. So um, along with essential information on what kind of taxon are you modeling, what is the location, what is the scale of analysis, where uh, are your biodiversity data coming from, what type of predictors are you using, and do you provide um, your, your data and code, and what kind of software have you used. All of these information will be contained in the overview section and really need to be provided also as flow text in your method section but also this information should be enough for for giving like a first impression um, of what you're actually doing so this is why we say um, just the overview section as flow text in the manuscript could be enough while all the other um, technical details should be contained in the full OTMAP table in your supplement. When you want to apply OTMAP, you basically have two possibilities. Um, um, the first option is that you just use the full OTMAP table that we provide as CSV supplement in the online publication and you just fill in um, all the different elements of the, of the table. We also provide this as color-coded um, tables so that you know um, depending on your um, modeling purpose which elements are necessary and which are not. The other option is to use um, the OTMAP Shiny app that Town Peterson already mentioned which you can find online um, under otmap.wsl.ch and I will now give you a short introduction to this um, Shiny app. Um, this is uh, a first screenshot, the, the starting page of the Shiny app that will just give you a little bit more information of what OTMAP actually is. In the background, um, what is important and what I will explain um, a little bit more is that it actually integrates the metadata dictionary from the Range Model Metadata Package by Cory Mero. Um, it also, um, we also in this publication of OTMAP, we also made an effort to extend the dictionary because also the dictionary really needs to grow in a community effort. Um, and OTMAP actually integrates this dictionary in order also to, to use a common uh, vocabulary when reporting, which will also facilitate meta-analysis later. So on, on top of the OTMAP in black, you have different tabs. Um, if you go onto the tab, create a protocol, then you will find all the um, different OTMAP sections um, in different um, smaller tabs. So you can um, fill in the sections on overview data, model assessment and prediction. On the left, you will see a progress bar, how much of the different items you've already fit, um, filled in. As I mentioned, um, depending on your model objectives, you will have more or less um, items that are obligatory or optional. And you also have a slider for, for hiding these optional fields um, if you just want to see which um, items are essential. And of course, you can download um, the, um, the progress of your protocol. 
either as a CSV, which is recommended because if you later want to um, upload it again to, uh, to the Shiny app, you need it as CSV, but you can also download it as a, um, as a Word document. Um, the RMS dictionary, we actually use that in the background of the Shiny app um, and it will give you auto suggestions based on the current state of the dictionary. So for example, in the algorithms, you will have a drop down menu listing all the different algorithms that are already contained in the RMS dictionary, but you can also just type in new algorithms. As you know, algorithms are constantly developing and new ones are appearing. So uh, by definition, the RMMS dictionary can never be exhaustive, but we always have to, uh, have to mature further um, based on, uh, on the newest developments. You can also import previous Otmo protocols, so you can also um, stop um, filling in Otmo protocols, save the protocol, um, come back to the Shiny app later, import it again and continue working on it. Also, if you've previously worked um, with a RMM uh, or with a range model metadata R package by Carimero, you can also use um, those files, the RMM file, and upload them in, into the Otmap Shiny app. Um, what might be also important is that all of the codes are open access on the GitHub account and you can also see examples there for the Otmap protocol, download them, load them into the Shiny app to, to see how it works. What I would like to stress is that, of course, this is just Otmap 1.0. It definitely needs to grow in a further community effort. We uh, will have to see um, not only what bugs are still contained in the Shiny app, but also what kind of elements are, are working okay, which elements need, need refinement, which elements may prove obsolete. Um, and so on. So similar to, um, to the update of the ODD protocol, we are hoping that we can make regular updates of OTMAP and of course also of the RMMS dictionary to really grow in a community effort. Right, what I would like you to take home is first of all ensuring transparency and reproducibility in, in your models and in your methods description will lead to higher quality in models and in assessments. And reporting standards, as the ones that I showed you here, will help you to structure your work and to get published. I also want to encourage you to open your source codes and your data as, as much as you can, because as Town Peterson already mentioned, your model can only be fully reproducible if you also give the codes and the data. I know with the codes it might be much easier than, than with the data, as often with the data there are um, also um, copyright restrictions taking place. So this is really just an encouragement, try your best to be as open as possible. And also, um, last point, which is really important, standards need to be agreed upon. So here we made a huge community effort and tried to agree on standards, but that was also accompanied by quite some debates. And now all of your potential new users are encouraged to give feedback um, to actually um, reach a new step of agreement in these standards. And these standards also need to grow further in a community effort. And with that, I want to thank you and also thank, of course, um, all, all the team and the collaborators that have been involved in this big effort.